Well, hello, uh, Pastor Dandy here. Uh, as we uh, uh, gather together today, we're going to take a little break today from Galatians, and we are going to do something a little different. Uh, a few weeks ago, I asked um, uh, those who are watching this video to present me with some questions. And a lot of questions came to me, or a few questions at least, not a whole lot, but a few questions came to me uh, from emails and Facebooks and phone calls from members of the congregation and people associated with the congregation. And and one of the questions, uh, we're going to take one day out of every week, uh, a break break from our regular study and our routine, and we're going to just do some Q&A stuff. And the question that I'm going to answer today is, why do your pastors wear robes? And I think that's a pretty good question. Uh, uh, you know, when I first heard it, I was like, well, of course, obviously, a pastor is going to wear robes because, you know, that's uh, the tradition that I have been brought up in, and that's, that's kind of what I'm used to. But um, it is something that maybe we need to continue to teach and think about as the people of God. Why do we have our pastors wear robes? And there's actually some very good reasons. But I want to begin by getting this one point out of the way. Pastors wearing robes, uh, uh, according to their office and their duty, is something that we call an adi afran. And an adi afra is, is something that is neither commanded nor forbidden in scripture. And so we do not wear robes in the Christian church and, and within the Lutheran tradition. Our pastors don't wear them because thus saith the Lord, your pastors must wear robes. But we do have some things within our Christian freedom that are good and useful. Uh, and, and actually, pastors wearing robes is good and useful uh, for a variety of reasons. And so what I want to do um, is first, uh, before we get to the robes, I want to talk about what a pastor is. Because uh, it's important, A, for the congregation to know what is the duty and demands that they should expect from their pastor. And second, it's important for the pastor to be reminded who he is and what he's supposed to do. And then we're gonna go back and we'll, we'll look at my robes over here. And, and there's a few little articles on them. Uh, and I, I will talk about why we have them uh, to teach these things in scripture, right? Because. Uh, church history delivers a lot of things to us uh, that are good and useful. And anything that is good uh, and expressing and teaching sound doctrine, we want to retain. We want to hold on to those things as best we can because the church throughout the ages has used this for a reason. And so uh, the first passage I want to look at to talk about what a pastor's duty is, is Acts chapter 20. I'm a little bit of context there. Acts chapter 20 is Paul, towards the end of his ministry, uh, he, he's going to Jerusalem expecting full well that he is going to be arrested and imprisoned, right? Uh, and so Paul's going to Jerusalem and he stops. He doesn't stop in Ephesus. He stops outside of Ephesus on his boat journey there. Uh, and he calls the pastors out from the city of Ephesus so that he can talk to them. Right, And so here is what St. Paul says to the, the uh, pastoral type folks in Ephesus uh, as his final farewell speech. And so here's what he has to say. He says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. <clears throat> I know that after my departure... Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish everyone in tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
I covet no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourself know that these hands ministered my, to my necessities and to those who were with me. And in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said himself, it is blessed more to give than to receive. And so Paul is uh, exhorting a few characteristics and important tasks to the church and especially to the church in Ephesus pastors. And so he, he gives them this image of them being shepherds over the flock, right? <coughs> now, we know that in John chapter 10, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. But now Paul uh, and, and elsewhere in the Bible uh, is assigning the pastors the task of being under shepherds to Jesus. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit has given them this duty. The Holy Spirit has called them to be overseers of the flock of Jesus. And that's important, right? Uh, because A, each member of the flock of Jesus has been obtained by Christ through his blood, right? How, how are people brought into the church? How are people um, made into disciples of Jesus? But through baptism, through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, that means that they have been indeed washed in the blood of Christ. And so each member of the flock is a treasured possession of our dear Lord, Savior, Jesus, and God tasked pastors to care for that flock. That's phenomenally important, right? Uh, but then Paul gives a warning because he says that fierce wolves are going to come into the church and even from amongst the pastors for them to follow after not the God who purchased and obtained them through the death of Jesus, but after themselves, right? Right? And so uh, they want to draw the disciples after them, and they want to convince themselves that they're not over shepherds, but they themselves are the shepherds, and they themselves are the ones that wish to be, are, uh, that need to be followed, right? Uh, and so there's a tendency and a danger for pastors when they're they're met with success or or even if they are met with a uh, little success in a small congregation to think that they can elevate themselves to a special position within the church and while their office is very special the temptation is for them to convince themselves that they are special right uh, but no Jacob's not special the office is special. We'll get back to that in a minute, right? And so Paul wants uh, uh, to remind the church in Ephesus, the pastors in Ephesus, that their job is not to serve themselves, but to serve Christ. Their job is to minister to the flock, to guard them from the wolves that are going to come and try to dilute truthful doctrine, to draw the sheep away from the flock of Jesus. And so the office is especially important, right? Right. Uh, not that the man should be followed, but that the man should lead the sheep to follow the good shepherd, right? Now, we have another passage, um, also from St. Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, and it says this, uh, that not all are pastors, right? Uh, that God has called only a few to serve in the office of ministry. And so he asks a bunch of rhetorical questions, right? Uh, and it says this, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now, the implied rhetorical uh, answer to all these rhetorical questions is no, not all have these callings, not all have these duties, right? But that God has called a select few to exercise these duties. And so Paul says, I earnestly 
but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way, the way of love, right? And so we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that not all are designated for the office that the pastor enters, but there are a select few. We'll get back to that point as well, right? 1 Corinthians 16, verse 16. It also says this. Now, this is to the flock and how they should regard their pastor. It says, be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. The church is to be subject to the pastor according to his office. Now, once again, the church isn't supposed to be subject to Jacob according to his whims, but subject to the pastor according to his office, mainly according to the office of the keys, the preaching of the word, and the administration of the sacraments. We'll get back to that. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, it says, And God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every weird uh, wind, weird uh, wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined together. Uh, and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. Make the body grow so that it builds up itself in love. Right? And so what does the pastor give to the church? Or what does, I'm sorry, what does God give to the church in order that it might grow closer to its head? Well, God calls men. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints, right? And so that we might grow up in the head so that the body of Christ might be lifted and built up. And so uh, uh, the pastoral ministry is set up and set aside for the good and the benefit and the growth of the church. All right. First Thessalonians chapter five, it says, we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work, be at peace among yourselves. Once again, we're given that reminder, all right? We're given that reminder that the pastoral office is to be esteemed and set apart within the church. And then we've got 1 Timothy 3, the first chunk of verses there. Then we see the weight and responsibility of the pastor um, is supposed to overshadow the man, and yet the man must treat the office with dignity. Here's what it says. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, the office of pastor, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, apt to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the church of God? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by the outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Right? And so, here we have in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the reminder that the man... The man can actually bring shame upon the office. And so the man must conduct himself in a certain way as a reminder of who he is and what he's called to do. We'll get back to that. And finally, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 7, it says, So I exhort the elders among you as, fellow, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, 
as well a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. Right? And so what is he what is Peter now telling the pastors to do? But to be shepherds. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, nor for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over these in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility." Clothed with humility, here we go, toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. And so, pastors wearing vestments, uh, these robes, these certain articles of clothing that he wears, um, are to serve a specific purpose, right? Uh, and one of the first purposes it serves is that it humbles the man under the office, right? Um, the pastor doesn't wear clothes to impress people, right? This is, this is not what I'm going to wear. My, my clergy collar or my alb and my stole, we'll look at those in a second. This is not what I would wear if I wanted people to be impressed with me and follow off of after me, right? I'd be wearing a nice suit or I'd be wearing something a little bit more fashionable um, than, than these things, right? Um, the the kind of baggy clergy shirt. Um, but God uh, uh, has called pastors to actually set themselves aside because their office is not their individual work, but it's the office of God. It's the office that God has set in the church in order to build up and care for the congregation of the people. And so the pastor's to preach the word, he's to administer the sacraments, he's to have oversight over the flock, caring for them in the love of Christ, right? And that means when I go about my duty as a pastor, I don't want people seeing Jacob. I don't want people seeing Jacob in his Carhartt t-shirt and his Wrangler jeans um, because it's not Jacob speaking. It's not Jacob working. It's not Jacob doing anything, right? I'm simply filling the office that God has called me to do. God is working through the office for the care of the church. God sends forth preachers. God sends forth those to administer the sacraments and those to hold what we call the office of the keys, those to forgive and retain sins, right? In John chapter 20, we missed this one, but Jesus says, he breathes on his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained, right? He gives that office to the church and that is carried out by the pastors. Okay, and so let's start with what I'm wearing right now. How does this remind me of my office? How is this faithful uh, in, in terms of uh, being a good audiophone? Well, uh, first of all, Pastors wear a black shirt, right? Uh, uh, or a lot of pastors do. They wear what's called a clerical shirt, right? Um, uh, and that is to remind us that the man is sinful. The, the office, right, is holy. And that's why the collar, right, around the neck, right, is a holy office. Uh, if you notice, this is kind of tight around my neck, right? Um, and it, it kind of resembles a dog collar. The office that I bear, the office that the pastor is called into, is a holy office. And so I'm not subject to my own will, right? When I take my dog for a walk and he starts to wander off or walk away, what do I do? I tug on the chain, right? I drag him back and I call, I tug him by his collar to redirect him on the path and the direction that he must go. I am a slave to Christ. Uh, pastors are slaves to God. Uh, they aren't there to fulfill their own desires. They aren't there uh, to call the sheep to follow after them, but they're calling the sheep to follow after Christ. 
And so I am not going into that church over there, uh, and I'm not going uh, about my work in this office for my own benefit and my own good, but at the command of Jesus for the good of the flock of Jesus. And this little garment here, this little thing around my neck, is a reminder of that. It's a reminder for the congregation that the pastor is laboring for them at the command of God, but it's a reminder to the pastor as well that it's not Jacob's ministry. It's not Jacob's church. It's not Jacob's preaching. It's God's. And so this is a helpful tool handed down to the church um, for generations to remind the pastor of what he's supposed to do. All right. And so then we have this stuff back here, right? Um, we have first the all, the big flowy robe thing, right? Well, the all is it's white that's what the word all means it means a big white thing a big white uh robe uh, and alms are to uh remind us of a couple of things first it says in ephesians 5 that jesus has purified and cleansed his church giving himself up for her uh so that she might be presented to him pure and holy without blemish or despect or uh defect raw uh spot or wrinkle um uh uh but in pure purity and holiness in his righteousness right um then we also remember revelation chapter 7 uh as the assembly of the church is gathered around the throne of god um what are they wearing they're wearing white robes right they're clothed in the robes of christ righteousness their sin has been washed away they have bathed themselves have been washed bleached white in the blood of the lamb then we're also then reminded of the transfiguration of christ that christ uh beamed brilliantly and his clothes beamed in bright whiteness right and so the pastor wears a white robe to remind the church a that christ washes away the sin b that the office of the pastor is a holy office instituted by god and also then it covers the man once again it covers the pastor meaning that the pastor isn't the one getting all the attention um, you know, I'm not going to go up there in my skinny jeans and my graphic t-shirt with my $90 haircut and go up there and try to impress you with how great I am. Rather, my job is to point you to what Christ does and how great Christ is and what Christ has done for his church, that he has bleached us white in his blood, that he has made us bright and white before the eyes of the Father, brilliant and glorious like him right right and so uh this is once again a, a an object meant to humble the pastor uh remind the pastor and the congregation of the pastor's office it sets the pastor apart from the congregation he's the only guy up there most of the time wearing a robe all right um and so it says that man is there serving me on uh, behalf of Christ. That man is there to forgive and retain my sins. He's there to preach God's word. He's there to build up the church, and he has an important office to bear. And so uh, it means that the congregation should uh, uh, bear this office with due reverence, but also it means that the pastor should be humbled in what he is doing. Uh, he should take his work quite seriously. He should be studying the scriptures and trying to preach them faithfully. Now, then there's this garment that pastors wear around their neck. And I don't know if it's coming through very clear. Uh, here's the, the uh, violet end that I wear in Lent. But here's the white one I'm wearing now in the season of Easter. This is called a stole. Uh, and it basically, it's just a big cloth that goes around the neck. And it's actually meant to resemble, as it goes around the neck, a yoke. Right? Um, uh, you know, you have different colors for the different seasons of the church year. So white for the season of Easter, violet for the season of Lent and Advent. There's also the green and the red um, for the different seasons and festivals of the church year. Uh, so the pastor is actually, in just what he's wearing, is serving to teach the congregation. But then also, it's meant to resemble the yoke, like a yoke that you would put over an oxen. That, that the pastor is a beast of burden, right? 
uh, uh, you, you put a yoke on the oxen so that they can tread out the grain, so that they can plow the field. And that is their primary purpose. Why do you have an ox? Why do you have a, a draft horse or a plow horse, right? You have them to bear the burden of the weight of the work of the farm. The pastor is there to bear the burden of service to the church. And we remember uh, that Jesus teaches um, uh, those, come unto me, those who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, because my burden is light, right? My, my, my burden is light. And so, uh, pastors wear the, uh, wear the stole to remind them that they are beasts of burden for Christ, right? That they're there to serve Jesus, but... Jesus has borne the burden of the sins of the people. Once again, Pastor Dandy is not the savior of Zion Lutheran Church, right? Uh, Pastor Dandy is not the savior of the people, but Jesus is. Jesus is the savior of God's people. And then finally, the pastors often will wear what's called a pectoral cross, meaning it goes across the pecs, the chest, right? Um, as the pectoral cross. Um, once again, just as a reminder of what the pastor is meant to do. The pastor is to wear and offer the cross. The pastor is to give the cross to the people of God, right? He is to give Christ to Jesus, right? And Christ has borne and carried the cross for us, right? Uh, and so that's the central thing right there that the pastor serves in the stead and the command of our Lord Jesus to forgive sins, to comfort the congregation, to shepherd the congregation, to guard the congregation against the wolves of false teaching. And then the congregation has the duty then. Uh, uh, as it says, uh, Paul reminds the church, uh, do not muzzle the ox as he treads out the grain. And so the ox, as he bears the burden of the church, well, the congregation should offer him respect, honor, um, provision, um, as he makes his living to preach the gospel. Those who preach but words should make their living by the word, as the scriptures say. And so they should honor and hear the teaching. They should take advantage of coming to hear the word of God as often as pastor is able to deliver it. Um, they should take advantage of the sacraments that the pastor offers, right? Um, uh, and they should honor the office that this man has. Uh, even if you don't particularly like the pastor, uh, you should honor the office, right? Because it's not the man, it's the office. And the man should conduct himself in a manner worthy of the office, right? And so also then, as I wear this, as I wear this, these are reminders that the office is bigger than me. Uh, it, it is a deterrent for pastors to get caught up in flagrant and continual sin that would scandalize the church because once again who is the pastor a slave to who is he a beast of the burden for but for Christ the pastor stands to represent Christ and so I hope that helps to answer the question talking about who and what a pastor is why would he wear these clothes well it's to teach right uh, and the same reason that the pastor would stand in a pulpit to preach the sermon or, or uh, stand in a lectern to read the readings or have an altar in front of the church. These all things are all things that stand to teach the church of God about what happens in the church service. What can we put our hope in? What are we meant to hear and to receive as the people of God? And so I hope this has been helpful. Um, if there are any questions or comments, drop one in the comment section of the video or, or send me an email at some point in time and we can talk about why pastors in the church wear robes. I think it's a good and healthy practice. Once again, neither commanded nor forbidden in scripture, but uh, uh, we in Christian freedom should seek to preserve practices and, and uh, traditions in the church that are faithful teachings of God's word. Wearing the robes is, uh, preaching the word is, uh, having pastors is. Uh, with that being said, go in peace, serve the Lord, have a blessed day. Tiny Luther says, preach the word, pastors. <laughs>